She is a woman of solid achievements. She made history in 2013 when she became the first African to take the helm of Oxfam International. So our work is solidarity work. Hmm? It is movement building. It is building the voices of people from the bottom to challenge those with power. It is a personal mantra. This time, she is confronting global challenges ranging from tax evasion by multinationals to climate change. Winnie does not just speak against these injustices. She commits to tackling global challenges without hesitation. She was in Poland attending the climate change talks in 2013, this time seeking concrete answers on reduction of emissions as well as funding to mitigate effects of climate change. What they found was a new proposal by the coal industry dubbed Clean Coal. It is then that Winnie led a walkout, aptly named Polluters Talk, We Walk. The discussion was being derailed by the coal industry. We first gave a warning we gave another warning and then we mobilized a walkout by the entire civil society. It had an impact. Did it? It did. They, they called us back and tried to negotiate and to put a proper balance between industry and people. Because this was an agreement to save the planet, save our one home, the earth, and save our lives, ordinary people's lives. It's not about big business only. Tell me more about this zeal, this fire to bring lasting solutions to Africa's problems. Where did it begin? I was raised by activists. For me, Winnie, I'm informed very much by the struggles of the women who raised me. My mother, my grandmother, these were strong women. Their leadership was the leadership that does not take for granted the space that has been given to women, that pushes barriers. My grandmother was inherited, was, an, was in a polygamous marriage, inherited by a stepson. She walked away from that and went to look for dignity and lived as a single woman. My mother built women's clubs and they fought for the right of the girl child to an education. They fought against early marriage. And here I am, advancing women's rights around the world. So to me, that's what leadership is, to see what's wrong and take a stand and insist and make a change. She was there when the Milton Obote regime plunged Uganda into political turmoil in which thousands died. Winnie quit her job as an engineer to join the national resistance movement that was led by the current president Yoweri Museveni between 1981 to 1986. This was at a great personal risk. Her father was a leader of a political party that had rejected the path of armed struggle. When I decided with other young people that for us now we are going to challenge this dictatorship, we are just going round in circles, we need a, a solution, he warned me, he said, Winnie, be careful, taking a revolutionary journey, you might be disappointed. And he said it to me by saying, go and read about this woman, French woman. So I took that warning and uh, over time I've found he had some, those were wise words. Our revolution has been uh, derailed in Uganda, but all is not lost. The struggle for a democratic Uganda is an aspiration that her husband, Dr. Kiza Besiger, continues to this day as Uganda's opposition leader. During the armed struggle, Besiger was a personal physician to their leader, Yoweri Museveni, who would later become the president of Uganda. They later fell out because they differed on matters of ideology. What has that been like? Very challenging. It's been very challenging because, like I said, we were part of a revolution. Then we saw the revolution become derailed and we took a stand and we, we challenged the leader. That challenge has come at a very high cost to many people, not just ourselves. This is what I always try to explain, that him and I are also part of that, part of a bigger struggle. We, we suffer too, but the people who suffer the most are the ordinary people. I mean, there are people we started this challenge with 
in, 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 we started this challenge many years ago, but some were killed, some were injured and uh, became lame forever. Some lo in these struggles, poor people suffer the most. Winnie strongly defends the need to expand the democratic space because there is need to accommodate all people and allow dialogue on sustainable development. First of all, I don't, <laughs> I don't blame one person. It's not Museveni who is causing all this. No, 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 no. This deficit in democracy is a result of who we are. Hmm? It's who we are. We are a people who want democracy, but who are not democratic. Hmm? So when we have even a good leader emerging, we quickly turn that leader into a dictator. So it's a dynamic. It's a system that you must change. Eh? It's not the individual. I don't think that President Museveni is a bad man. I've worked with him. He meant well and he led us well for a long time. But you come into power and a certain dynamic, you find a certain dynamic and over time it takes you in a certain direction. So it's, it's about system change. Eh? It is a process that is largely informed by values. You must drive against a current, and that current are your own people. Eh? They want you to stand there and be a leader who is like a king. You must say no. You must say that no, I am your servant because that's what democracy is. You pay my bill. You are the bosses. So to translate that into a program and be consistent in driving a democratic struggle requires a lot of discipline and holding on to a vision that's not necessarily your people's vision. Yes. The people's vision is more feudalistic. Our people have not completely gotten rid of their feudalistic culture. That's why you find in Uganda women kneeling. I keep challenging because I'm trying to attack the mind, to cause a mind shift. I say, you can't be a Democrat when you kneel before men, because democracy assumes equality. Yes. Hmm? It's equality. But now, if you are going to kneel before men and before leaders, then you're putting them on a pedestal and making them kings. But they are not. They're your servants. Is that the part of the reason why you do not want to be referred to as Mrs. Pesige? Of course. I mean, I mean, this is a man called Besiji Amu. Why should I now change my name to his? My grandmother never did. This thing of taking a man's name is European. It came here in colonial times. It's Victorian. I mean, even my own mother, until she died, in my village, in her family, in her clan, people were not going around calling her Mrs. Bianima. They called her Gatrida Kawasingo, her real name. My grandmother the same. And the whole point is that ordinary people actually didn't always embrace the colonial ways, but the middle classes think that it is a higher way of being to be like a Muzungu, a British person. Well, I think British people are okay the way they are, <clears throat> but I don't have to change myself to be like them. So I keep my name, just like my mother was her name among her people, although she would sign Mrs. Bianima when she's signing documents. She was a middle-class woman. But in her community, nobody even recognized her like that. No, they just called her Kawasim. <laughs> She is out there challenging the West and its perception of numerous issues, one of those being the role of aid in the fight against poverty. Winnie speaks loudly and clearly that for aid to make a difference in developing nations, it needs to be redefined. She has the statistics to support her assertions. An Oxfam report indicates that the 85 richest people in the world own as much as the poorest 3.5 billion people. Is this the kind of world we want to live in? We're concerned because, Oxfam's concerned because this has an impact on poverty. We cannot eradicate poverty with these levels of extreme inequality. In her many engagements on the international scene, she knows for the global conversations 
to have an impact on the very local populations, gender imbalance must be tackled, women must be empowered. What is the face of that empowered woman? An empowered woman is a woman who has got food for her children, whose children are going to school, who has a voice in her home, whose husband listens to her, respects her, and decides with her on how to invest in their family and in their business, if they have a business. So a woman who's free to work is a woman who's free of violence, who is not beaten, who is not abused psychologically, who enjoys her freedom. She does look beautiful. That's a beautiful woman. When the story of Africa's great daughters is finally told, there is no doubt hers will stand in the pride of place. A woman who rose to challenge when her people needed her. For Citizen Weekend, I am Anne Mawade.